this week. So for me, you know this very well, you're specialists. So I capitalize on it and go fast. Okay, so be prepared for it. Okay, so this is the second thing. And I promise that uh, today I will speak mostly, if not only, about uh, photons and atomic gases, and I will keep this promise. Okay, so the title is uh, Cooperative Effects and Photon Localization. Ah, okay, so now we got this. Uh, in atomic uh, gases. And uh, uh, the second title is Phase Transition in Non-Hermitian Random Matrices. So it's more, uh, the first title is about the physics that we are interested in. The second title is about how to implement this physics using interesting and non-usual theoretical tools. Okay, so uh, this is not based on the book uh, written uh, with Gilles Montembeau that I indicated before, but this is an ongoing work that I started uh, many years ago um, at the conference with uh, Robin Kaiser, that I guess is a well-known uh, um, figure here around. And uh, then uh, it went on until this very day, because uh, the day before yesterday, I sent uh, for publication another paper of uh, our Gang of Four. And the Gang of Four is uh, Aaron Gero, who was a PhD student with me at that time, but now is a faculty member at Technion. Uh, Robin, and Louis Belando, who was a PhD student of Robin and is now working in uh, Bordeaux. So, and there are a number of papers, and there are even more, in fact. <clears throat> uh, okay, but uh, I will not follow those papers. I will try to be, anyway, to give you the idea. So, what, it, what is it about? Uh, it contains two, two ideas that we try to put together. The first idea is what I discussed already for two uh, uh, courses, uh, coherent multiple scattering of photons, and Anderson photon localization, phase transition, and scaling. So all this, you already heard about it from me, ad nauseum, even. So this you know. The second ingredient, which I did not discuss so far, is cooperative effects and decay superradiance, <clears throat> and uh, the competition between those two uh, physical effects. So, first question: Who heard about superradiance and subradiance and cooperative effects at large? Who knows about this? I, I didn't ask who knows at nine o'clock, but who knows in general? So who never heard about superradiance and cooperative effects in atomic physics? Never at all, first time. Okay. So I will try to mix between the two populations and to explain a bit, but not too long. So uh, this, the idea is to try to put together those two ideas. And the first one I explained, the second one I will explain in a moment. What is the framework? The framework is, will be the multiple scattering of photons by a cold atomic gas. So a cold atomic gas is a gas of uh, dipoles. We will take them as two-level systems. Uh, those two-level systems can be degenerate. Okay? And uh, the photons, they perform multiple scattering in such a cold atomic gas. It is very much idealized. So I want to say, to stress this, because I saw yesterday a very uh, specialized and, and deep uh, discussions in your posters. So here it's a, I'm a theoretician. It's an idealized situation. So don't ask me about Doppler effects because the atom moves and all this, because you know the answer and I don't know the answer. So don't ask me. Now, uh, this is a slide that we already saw. Uh, before. So we are interested in multiple scattering of photons by those uh, cold atoms. 
So we know that there are two characteristic lengths, but the only difference that I added here is that, it's me that does it, is that I give you an expression for the elastic mean free pass, which uh, uh, York gave uh, two lessons ago. And this elastic mean free pass goes like one over the density of scatterers times the scattering cross section. And here, I will take a resonance scattering of the photons by the atoms, where this cross section goes like the wavelengths. Uh, by the way, sorry, this is the same as this. This is the same wavelength. So just to remove the zero here. And the cross section goes like lambda squared. So this is resonance scattering. Uh, so this is the mean free pass that we have. And indeed, you notice that the, this mean free pass is much larger than the average distance between scatterers, which is given by this number, okay? because scattering is very efficient. So far, so good. I'm not wild so far. It will come. So uh, yesterday, I also uh, um, generically uh, defined a disorder parameter, which I call W. But yesterday, I told you that I'm not interested to, to say what it is. But now I'm interested. And this parameter W, which uh, uh, measures the strength of this order, is just defined by this uh, 1 over K0 L, where uh, K0 is the wave number, and L is the elastic mean free pass. And indeed, if you remember, uh, what we defined as weak disorder is that uh, the wavelength is much smaller than the elastic mean free pass. And this means that this parameter uh, is small. <clears throat> okay? So weak disorder is W, is dimensionless parameter. And this dimensionless parameter is small. Okay? This is what we call weak disorder. But now this is a very simple way to uh, write this uh, parameter uh, for disorder. And I want to write it in a very complicated way, just to, to cause pain to you. And this is the more complicated way of writing this. But why do I want to write it that way? Uh, first of all, it's, it's useful, you will see. And, but this is just a, another way to write exactly the same. So here, uh, the elastic mean free pass, as I uh, wrote before, is given by this. So sigma is this lambda squared, and the density is number of scatterers. N is number of scatterers divided by the volume. And we are in three dimensions. Okay, so this is the elastic mean free pass. K0, we know to write it in term using lambda. And in fact, you can rewrite all this that way, where we introduce a, a new quantity that is called n perp, which is the number of transverse channels, which is defined by this in three dimensions. Who is familiar with the notion of number of transverse channels? Who is not familiar? This I don't believe. This is not possible. So because you are very familiar with the idea that if you take a waveguide and you look at the number of, uh, of modes that you can have in this waveguide, this number of modes is the number of transverse channels. And this, don't tell me that you never heard about this because I cannot believe. <clears throat> okay? So this is simply a convenient way, but it's just a redefinition. This is the same quantity of rewriting this dimensionless disorder parameter. OK? Uh, so far, so good? Slowly, slowly? Good. So again, weak disorder means W is much smaller than 1. Uh, wavelength is much smaller than the elastic mean free pass. <clears throat> so let me remind you something that we said yesterday about uh, Anderson uh, transition. So. I showed you this uh, slide yesterday, and I showed you that uh, a basic ingredient to study a phase transition, and here we are talking about this quantum phase transition, this Anderson phase transition, is first of all to find a scaling parameter. And it's true for any phase transition, also in thermodynamics, in statistical mechanics, in field theory, whatever. If you want, if you feel that you have a phase transition, uh, then you are looking for scaling quantities, 
which means quantities that are not just functions of all the parameters, but that can be written in terms of a small amount of parameters. Okay? This is absolutely generic. And yesterday, what I showed you is that we can identify for the Anderson transition such a scaling parameter, which we call the conductance, which was this uh, boxes and the uh, quantum crossings, but I will not say quantum crossings today. So you gain. Okay. Uh, so you don't have to know, to remember what is a quantum crossing, or to know, if you were not here yesterday. <clears throat> but this is a scaling parameter. Okay. And what we saw is that this parameter, this conductance, in fact, is a function not of two parameters, which is size of the system and disorder, but it's a function of a single parameter that uh, can be written under that way, where this psi was identified and defined as the localization length. And this was a result of a numerical uh, study of the Anderson Hamiltonian. I don't want to write this Hamiltonian. It's not necessary here. But what we noticed is that there is indeed scaling, which means that for very, very different values of disorder, we can put all the curves of G as a function of this on a single universal curve. This is scaling. This is the meaning of scaling. And it is extremely uh, unusual that we have scaling. And it means something. And this was in two dimensions. In two dimensions, you see that there is no si singularity of this scaling uh, expression. But in three dimensions, we saw that there is also scaling, but there is a singularity here. And this singularity, in fact, tells us that there is a phase transition. It's numeric, and, uh, uh, and we, we don't know how to say much more than this. There is something that I did not stress enough yesterday, but this is good for you to know, is that this Anderson phase transition, although you heard about this more than what is the number of transverse uh, modes in a waveguide, this phase transition has never been observed unambiguously in physics. Never, experimentally. We cannot prove analytically that it exists, but it has never been observed, the transition. Now, in less than three dimensions, so you have transition only above three dimensions. In less than three dimensions, in one and two, you are always strongly localized. This strong localization in one and two dimensions has been observed many times since a long time. Uh, in three dimensions, what people have observed is weak localization or localization transition, but that, that are not driven by disorder, like here, but are driven by other things, like interactions in uh, electronic systems. So the problem in electronic systems is that you can put disorder. But when you increase the disorder, which means that you approach the Anderson phase transition, then uh, electron interactions are enhanced by this weak localization. And what takes over is not Anderson localization fixed point, but it's another fixed point that is driven by interaction that is generically, generically, generically called a MOT transition. So it is not Anderson transition, it's something else. And the big hope using when uh, uh, waves and cold atoms came into, into the play was that photons that do not have interaction will be a good candidate for localization. And a lot of people are, are trying to observe and have been trying to observe this transition with photons, but so far there is no uh, proof. Although I could flash here a few uh, cover pages of nature that shows and say, here is phase uh, Anderson phase transition, but eventually it came out, you had to wait half a year, one year, that for the comment that, uh, well, it was a bit early to to decide that it was under some phase transition. But this just tells you that people are really working hard on it. 
And this is uh, our job as physicists to try bold things and from time to time to not to succeed. Okay, so it's very good to do mistakes also, but the, po the, the bottom line is that this phase transition uh, as is, has not been observed. Okay, so uh, uh, we were in that pool. We are in that pool of people looking for, uh, for that kind of uh, Anderson transition. But then we wanted to add uh, something more. Uh, before going uh, uh, further, I must say that there is a, a system that is extremely, extremely close to this, to the observation of this phase transition, and this is an experiment. So this is uh, uh, an experimental result that I showed here, which is uh, the quantum evolution of uh, the atomic kicked rotor. And it is not localization in uh, real space, but this is localization in the momentum, momentum space in 3D. And this is an experiment that has been performed by Pascal Schriftkiser and collaborators. And the theory was done, uh, started a uh, long time ago, and was done along the years by uh, different groups. Uh, one is uh, Shmuel Fishman at the Technion, and uh, Italo Guarneri in Italy, and uh, uh, a lot of very, very clever people. And this is what they observe, and this is the best observation of Anderson phase transition, but it is not in real space, it is in momentum space. But this is beautiful experimental result. Okay? Did you know about this? So you see, this is the idea of uh, school, is to learn new things, not to get bored. Um, so this is the conductance, this is the scaling quantity, but here it's in momentum space, so it's a little bit more complicated. There is no size, but there is time. So I do not uh, want to discuss this more, but this is, I think, they deserve a lot of credit for this experiment. <coughs> uh, and you see, it was not, uh, it was uh, 2010, whereas first papers on Anderson uh, transition is uh, 1959. Takes time. Uh, what typically means the localization in momentum space uh, in terms of wave? I don't want to discuss this. I have really a lot of to discuss. If you want to know, I can uh, discuss uh, also a long time with this. Uh, but here, I, 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 it's, okay. it, I just want to, to show this beautiful result. So this is for localization. Now, uh, uh, cooperative effects. Uh, super radiance and sub uh, radiance. So, uh, the idea of uh, cooperative spontaneous emission uh, is basically addressing the following question. If you take a single atom in the uh, QED vacuum, then uh, because this, the electrons interact with uh, the virtual modes, photon modes. In fact, it will, if it is in an excited state, it will emit a photon by going down. And this is called spontaneous emission because there is no uh, other source of, uh, of electromagnetic field, okay? So this spontaneous emission, as uh, Philippe said the first lecture or something like this, second, can be in fact described as a broadening of the energy levels of the electrons, the atomic electrons. Okay, so this is spontaneous emission, and you can describe this spontaneous emission using a beautiful model that is called the wigner weisskopf model, which uh, eventually is just a Lorentzian distribution, exactly the way that you described yesterday and the day before yesterday. So this you know, you know very well wigner weisskopf okay? And now the idea is the following. Suppose that I, I take another atom, so I have an atom, an electron in the excited state, so it wants to emit spontaneously a photon, and I take another atom, and I ask now the, the question, is the presence of the other identical atom in the ground state going to affect the rate at which the photon will be emitted spontaneously. And the answer is 
Uh, yes, usually, but it depends. It depends on the distance between the two atoms. Okay? And the fact that the presence of a second atom may affect the spontaneous emission rate is a cooperative effect, cooperation of the second atom. And uh, this may enhance the rate of emission, or it may reduce the rate of emission. In one case, we say that we have more radiance, more emission of a photon. It's super radiance. In other case, you have less, then it is sub-radiance. Okay, so this is basically the idea, the simple idea. So this is if you have just two atoms. But suppose now that you have a gas of atoms. How is it possible to observe those cooperative effects, which means now that the, all the atoms will try to discuss between them coherently and say at some point, so one of them or few of us, we are in an excited state, and let's just cooperate and emit our photons uh, coherently, all of us together. Or we can say, we don't want to cooperate, we want to stay independent, and then each of them emits a photon as if it was alone, and this is this wigner weisskopf photon. And you have everything in between. Okay, so this is the idea of cooperative effects and, uh, uh, and the super radiance. <clears throat> so uh, all of this is a result of quantum phase correlations between the atoms as induced by the dipole-dipole interactions. You are with me? This was simple. So now let's uh, make it uh, more complicated. Uh, so it's still simple now. So I'm, I'm going to show you in two slides uh, what I just said for two atoms. So if you have two atoms, identical atoms in uh, their ground state, so there is an interaction here, but this has nothing to do with what I said. This is Van der Waals interaction. That also you uh, explained. So I capitalize on what you said, so you know everything about this, but I'm not interested in this. Uh, I'm interested in uh, those states, which are called Dicke states, in which I have one atom in the ground, in the excited state, and I bring close by the second atom in the ground state, and then I ask uh, whether the spontaneous emission rate of this atom will be affected by this one. Okay, so well-defined question. To well-defined question, there is a well-defined answer, and the well-defined answer uh, is the following. So all the, the, the very early works on, uh, on cooperative uh, emission is to put to the credit of uh, Dicke, who was uh, an absolutely terrific physicist working in many, many different fields, both in theory and in experiments, and this he did in the 1950s. And just to say, uh, Anderson and Dicke were both uh, faculty at Princeton, so I want to just to make them compete, but they came from the same place. And so now uh, to come back to my two uh, atoms. So if you put two atoms uh, close together, then this will induce a potential between those two. So this is this potential. Epsilon here is either plus one or minus one, depending if we are looking at this state or that state, which are the generate. And uh, so this is the effective potential between the two atoms. And gamma here is the spontaneous emission rate of a single atom, single electron. Okay? So this is the unit of, spontane of, of energy. Uh, so the, this potential goes like uh, 1 over r, but uh, uh, it is attractive at short distance, and it oscillates. And this gamma is the... Uh, imaginary part that you get from the second order perturbation theory. And this gives you the emission rate of the collection of the two atoms, when one is in the ground state and one is in the excited state. So now this is the form that it has. This is an exact result, an exact calculation. And R is the distance between the two atoms. So now look at uh, this expression here, and then you will understand superradiance and subradiance. If R goes to zero, which means that the atoms are very close one to the other, 
Then you see that this guy goes to one, and the uh, uh, emission rate is now gamma times one plus epsilon. If epsilon is equal to plus one, which is this state, then the emission rate is twice the emission rate for a single atom, so which means that you enhance the radiance, the spontaneous emission. And this is a super radiance. In the other state, epsilon equals to minus one, you see that gamma is now equals to one minus one, which is zero, and therefore the spontaneous emission rate is zero, which means that the photon does not escape. So the physics is very, very simple for this. What does it mean that the photon does not escape? You could say, ah, the photon is localized, so we are very happy we have localization. But it's not, well, it is true, but the physics is very simple. You have an excited electron here, you have an atom with electron in the ground state here. So this atom emits by spontaneous emission its electron, okay, and the photon goes out. But this photon is absorbed by the second atom that goes in the excited state, whereas the first one goes to the ground state. And then it does it forever. So which means that the photon will never leave this collection of two atoms, so it is trapped there. And this is subradiance. There is no emission of photon, okay? But for epsilon equal to plus one, you can trigger it, and in fact, you can increase this emission rate. This is super radiance, okay? So what is so simple for two atoms is extremely difficult for n atoms. And there is no simple solution. There is one solution, the decay solution, which is mean field. I will not discuss it uh, more. Okay, so this is basically the idea of cooperative effect. So now the point, uh, how does it affect, uh, so we have effective theories, things like this, how does it affect the radiance of a, a gas of atoms? If the atoms uh, in the gas emit independently, Wigner-Weisskopf, Wigner -Weiss then you can show that the intensity that is emitted is proportional to the number of atoms. And the intensity as a function of time decreases exponentially. So this is Wigner Weisskopf. You know Wigner Weisskopf? Yes. So then you can fall asleep. But if you don't know, don't fall asleep. But if you know, it's okay. So, and moreover, the emission is isotropic. So you emit photons in all directions uh, equally. Now, if you have super radiant emission, then the intensity is proportional to the square of the number of atoms. And it is an isotropic, especially, and it has, as a function of time, it has this behavior. So it has a peak. This peak is that, what I told you, that all the atoms, they speak together and they say, oh, now we want to emit our photon. And they emit it in a peak in time. And the width of this peak, so here it is written, it's very difficult to see, it's called tau s, okay? And the, uh, the, the smaller the, the width, the more, Coherent is the emission. And if tau s becomes larger and larger and larger, then you go back eventually to a Wigner Weisskopf, independent emission. Okay, so this is basically uh, the characteristics of super, uh, super radiance. Uh, I want to stress that uh, sometimes in the literature, uh, this behavior of intensity proportional to n squared is the, the, the main feature of super radiance, but this is not really true. Uh, it is rather the mechanism leading to the coherent phasing of atoms. So I don't want to enter here between, in the difference between super radiance and super fluorescence, but just remember that uh, super radiance is really a quantum problem, whereas super fluorescence is more of a classical problem. Okay, but again, if you want to know more about this, you can come to me, but I don't want to enter into this more. Okay, so... Uh, so far, so good. You are with me? Alert, awake, full of energy? Good. So now, the, the, the clash between Anderson and Dickey. The clash. Uh, <clears throat> so, in order to get super radiant emission, all the atoms must see in phase the same electromagnetic field. So they must see the, the electromagnetic field and to say, we 
behave coherently or non-coherently. So this is the, the idea of, uh, of Dick uh, super, yes, super radiance. In order to achieve this, this is true that if the volume is small, then you have better chances to see this super radiance. Uh, by the way, like Anderson phase transition, DK super radiance really was not, I mean, I wouldn't say what was not observed, but it is debated and it is uh, even spirited debate. So it's still something that people are, are working very hard to observe uh, and ambiguously. <clears throat> So now, if you have a, a large system, which is what you have usually, then you expect, because you have a gas of atoms, they are uh, distributed at random. You have electromagnetic fields, photons, that do multiple scattering. And then you expect, on the basis of what I'm telling you again and again since the beginning of the week, that there is Anderson localization. If there is Anderson localization, this means that the photon modes Will, will be spatially localized in a volume which is the localization length, psi, to the power d. d is the dimensionality of our system. And then the point is that not all the, 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 the atoms will see coherent light, but only a fraction of them, those who are within uh, uh, localization lengths. All the other atoms, they are just incoherent one with the other. So which means that you will have only a fraction of the atoms, which is this, that are coherent at most. So you have much less than what you would like to have for Dicke superradiance because of this Anderson localization. And this, as a result, will strongly increase this time tau s that you have. So this time tau s, I did not write it in my previous slide, but for just, uh, you remember that this intensity that goes like, and this is tau s, this is intensity, this is time. So this time tau s goes like the log of the number of atoms divided by the number of atoms. If you have big number of atoms, tau s is small, and then it is more and more, uh, it is uh, smaller. But if you have localization, inst instead, the new tau s will be affected by localization, and it will be affected by this factor, which is just a ratio of photons that, of atoms that can speak coherently. And this is much larger than this, which means that uh, the super radiant peak will be much broader and therefore you kill superradiance. Overall, what I'm saying is that Anderson localization and cooperative spontaneous emission are competing effects. It's Anderson against decay. So who is going to win? This is a question. What do you think? I have now a gas. I have those two things. If you are convinced that uh, there are on the only two things, uh, the two uh, uh, players here, what, what is your guess? Who is going to win? Is it possible to observe localization without co cooperative effects? Or I will observe cooperative effects with no influence of disorder. So this, there are two op options. The third option is that it's a mix of two. So who is in favor of only decay superradiance? Who is in favor of uh, Anderson localization? Well, in fact, uh, and who is in favor of the third option? This is people that do not like to commit themselves, you know. <laughs> so uh, congratulations to the bold people that says that mostly it's uh, Dicke who is going to win. Dicke is going to win, most probably. But this is still an open question, but this is what I want to discuss from now on, okay? So... I, did I succeed to convince you that it's an interesting problem? You can say yes, say yes, no, yes. it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move. So now I'll, uh, I'll be a bit wild again, as I said at uh, the beginning, 
because uh, all those uh, tools, you know them, at least the starting tools. So I want to describe this system using uh, the total Hamiltonian that uh, describes n identical two-level atoms located at random positions, so this is the disorder. I will look at the uniform distribution of uh, atoms with electric uh, dipole moments d in the quantum radiation field E. So the Hamiltonian is the Hamiltonian of the atoms. So this, now you know very well what it means, because Philippe wrote it several times. This is the Hamiltonian of the quantized electromagnetic field. And this is the interaction between the two uh, uh, using this electric dipole representation. Okay, this is the dipole uh, moment operator interacting with the electric field. And now, what we like to do uh, in such cases, usually, is to write an effective Hamiltonian. Uh, this, the word effective also we heard uh, several times. And this effective Hamiltonian is obtained by tracing out the photons, to take the trace over all the photon degrees of freedom, which are those ones, and to end up with an Hamiltonian that describes only the atoms. Since we trace over an infinite number of degrees of freedom, the uh, uh, overall Hamiltonian at the end will be non-Hermitian, necessarily. And this non-Hermeticity is, in fact, this question that was asked uh, to Philippe the other day. How comes that you have <coughs> energies with uh, imaginary parts? You have energies with imaginary parts because the Hamiltonian is non-Hermitian. And if it is non-Hermitian, then you know that the eigenvalue spectrum is not real, but it's complex. Okay, so this is just the outcome of doing the trace over the electromagnetic field degrees of freedom, and this is the Hamiltonian that you obtain. So this is a beautiful Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian, uh, you see that uh, here there is an imaginary part. So you have an assembly of uh, non-interacting atoms, but you see that their energy now is not only h bar omega zero, but you have an imaginary part, and this imaginary part just tells, tells you about spontaneous emission of each atom independently. So this already is non-emission. But moreover, uh, those atoms, they interact now, and this is the interaction term. This interaction term, so those operators are atomic raising and lowering uh, operators that also Philippe defined, and you have an interaction between them which is dimensionless. All the dimensions are in gamma zero. Okay, and this Vij is random, and it's complex valued. So it has, this is complex valued, and it is random because it takes into account the random position of the atoms. Okay, so this is a beautiful Hamiltonian, which bears a lot of similarities with other problems in physics, for instance, spin glasses, and we liked it very much, and it's a beautiful object to work with. And now here is the expression of uh, Vij. Uh, the real part gives you, in fact, the interacting potential between the atoms, exactly what I showed you for the two atom case. But here it's for n atoms, so it is complicated. And it is so complicated that I don't want to tell you more about uh, this. Uh, just notice that Rij are uh, distances between atoms i and j. Those are random variables. P and Q are a trigonometric function that I don't want to write for a, given, for a reason that I will tell you in a second. And this is the real part. And the imaginary part gives you the photon escape rate. And again, it is, a random, it, is a, it is random because of the Rij, and it involves those P and Q. So this is very difficult to work with, although we like to do it. And if, uh, I will go immediately to the limit of uh, scalar waves, which means that I will forget about polarization. And in that case, those two expressions simplify to this. So in that case, Q equal to zero and P is equal to two third, and you get this and this. So this is much simpler, okay? And therefore, I don't have to write what is P and Q, what are P and Q. And uh, this looks very much like uh, the expression that I showed you for two atoms, okay? Uh, but those are random matrices. Beta and gamma, they are random matrices. 
n by n, because there are n atoms. Okay. So uh, now, which quantity to study? Uh, so one uh, thing that we had in mind was the following. Let's just take a cloud of, uh, of atoms like this, put one atom in the excited state, all the other ones are in the ground state, and then this atom will emit a photon, a way or another, that we have to, to calculate. This photon will perform multiple scattering on the atoms, and then we will look at the emission rate of, uh, of this cloud of atoms, uh, of photons going out. If a photon does not go out, I will say that it is localized. And now I will try to answer the question, why is it localized? Because the multiple scattering of photons is governed by Anderson localization, so the photon does not go out because it is exponentially localized, or it does not go out because it is subradiant and the gas does not emit photons, or something in between. Remember the three questions? So this is the question. And uh, so this is typically the, the wave function that I'm interested in. So this is uh, the state where uh, there is only one atom in the excited state. All the other ones are in the uh, ground state, and there is zero photon. And uh, this is the state where all the atoms are in the ground state, and there is one photon that does multiple scattering. And this is the amplitude of this as a function of time. OK. So, uh, now, there is something that I want to stress, is that uh, escape rates are not a transport quantity. So uh, I'm not sure that this remark will be fully appreciated here, but uh, because there is something that I said but it was not very obvious during the first two lectures, is that you notice that what, is, what describes Anderson localization are transport quantities. Uh, I said, you know, electrical conductance, but an escape rate is not a transport quantity. So you may say already, if you are really a specialist of Anderson localization, this is not a good quantity to study localization because, because it is not a transport quantity. But again, this is a remark for specialists. But this is a good remark. But uh, you may not fully appreciate it. But uh, it will come. So um, there is one way to uh, study this I mean, this photon escape rate, to do it properly, is to write an evolution equation for the density matrix. And in the Lindblad form, this Lindblad form takes into account this non-hermeticity of the Hamiltonian, of the effective Hamiltonian. You know what is Lindblad, Lindblad form of a density matrix? So this is the form that it takes here. And you see that it depends on our effective non-hermitian Hamiltonian. And it depends on gamma ij, which is the imaginary part of the potential. Right? It does not depend. So it depends on beta ij, because here there is the Hamiltonian. But here you see that this Lindblad term, in fact, is governed by only the imaginary part of, uh, of the interacting potential. And this is a very known result that uh, goes back to Michael Steven, 1964. And this is uh, very well known. It has been rediscovered by many uh, prominent physicists. But uh, so this is the, the idea that uh, this emission rate is, is governed by uh, this imaginary part of the interacting potential. So this is, this is a fact of life. OK? So then, according to this, noticing this, we decided that uh, the photon escape rates from the atomic gas are obtained from the eigenvalues of this random matrix. By the way, because this random matrix depends on the distances between atoms, it is called an Euclidean random matrix, because there are other random matrices. So this is an Euclidean random matrix. It's a matrix, n by n matrix, that is random. And the randomness comes from distances between, between points. So this is the name. OK, so let's study this random matrix. And we will see from the eigenvalues of this, those escape rates 
if we have a localization transition, if we have something like this, and so on and so forth. You are with me? You want to proceed? So I want to. <clears throat> so for a scalar waves, scalar case, this matrix is given just by this. So this is indeed a, a random matrix. And I'm interested in the eigenvalue density, P of gamma, of this n by n random matrix. Okay, so let's uh, look at the distribution of eigenvalue densities of this. We did it numerically. Ah, and we did it first before we did some numerics. Uh, I must uh, uh, define some dimensionless quantities. So here, all the distances will be measured in units of the wavelength, because you see, this is naturally the units that shows up here. So I define, for instance, the volume of the system in units of the wavelengths defines a, a dimensionless parameter A. So A is just the volume in units of wavelengths. Okay? And uh, the disorder is already defined in units of the wavelengths because of what I showed you earlier. Okay? So now I have two parameters that I can change. is the volume of the system, which is A, and the strength of the disorder, which is W. Both are dimensionless quantities. Okay? And here, this is how it looks. This is numerics. And this is uh, the distribution of eigenvalues for a large system, 60 wavelengths, and a weak disorder. W is 10 to the minus 3. And in fact, what what is this system? It is a very dilute system. It's big, and uh, atoms are very far away, one from the other. Okay? And we expect that they will emit independently. So, which means that, in fact, the distribution of eigenvalues will be centered around gamma zero, this uh, single, single atom uh, emission rate. Now, Gamma here in this plot is measured in units of gamma. No, no, this is not. No, 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 not here. All my, the surprises here. This gamma is measured in units of gamma zero, which means one means gamma zero. Okay? And indeed, if the system is very dilute, then you see that mostly you observe emission rates, which are as if the, all the atoms are independent. It's Wigner Weisskopf Fuji. We are happy. Good. It fits our uh, idea of what it should be. So now I increase the disorder. If I increase the disorder, so this is uh, 10 to the minus 3, this is 10 to the minus 1, you see that the di distribution becomes broader and asymmetric. It shifts towards small values of gamma. Okay? But this is okay, smaller values of, larger uh, values of disorder. I increase disorder. And then I increase again disorder, and this is what I obtain. So this is for disorder uh, equals to 10. And you see that the distribution is strongly picked around zero. Gamma equals to zero means subradiance, that your photon is localized, does not escape. It's beautiful. All this is just by studying numerically this uh, stupid matrix. Okay? It's just result, there is nothing more. And eventually, if you take a disorder to be extremely, extremely strong and small volume, then we expect to see the decay limit. And indeed, the distribution has only two peaks, one subradiant peak and one superradiant peak. Okay? And this is very simple to, to obtain this analytically, by the way, <laughs> because this is a matrix that is full of one. And it has two eigenvalues, zero and n. And then when we saw it, we were extremely happy. So this was in 2008. And we said, we saw localization, and even perhaps we saw localization transition. And we were absolutely excited. And uh, we wrote a paper, we published a paper, and uh, we, everybody was happy, champagne was flowing, and all this. So now, if there is localization, and it looks like, because we are happy, and uh, it, should, it means that it exists a scaling function, because you remember it's phase transition. It must be scaling at some point. 
So we should be able to define a scaling function and uh, to characterize this scaling function, to characterize p of omega using this scaling function. So we looked for a scaling function, and this is what we proposed. We proposed to define this object, which depends on volume, renormalized, and disorder, and which is the relative number of localized states, which means states having a vanishing escape rate, which means that in this uh, plot, we just put a cutoff at one, which is completely arbitrary. It can be at two or at one half, it does not change anything. And all the states that are below are counted in this function, and all the states that are above, they are not counted. So this is precisely what it is. The one is because we took one as a cutoff, but this is independent of it, and this is this function. This function is defined between zero and one, the way it is written here, and then what we did was uh, to look if this function has a scaling form. If it has a scaling form, you remember what it means? It means that it is not a function of A and W independently, but it should be a function of one parameter only, and this parameter can be written as A divided by some length, which depends on this order, and which will be, will be the localization length. Okay? It's always the same thing. There is, you know, it's no surprise. So we tried this, and so this is the C, the C function when it is written, just, uh, plotted just as function of volume for different values of disorder ranging over five orders of magnitude. So for very weak disorder, from very weak disorder to very strong disorder. And so you see you have a cloud of points. But if there is scaling, then by properly writing this function in terms of one parameter that we have to find, we could put this cloud of points on one curve only, exactly what I showed you for localization before, for the conductance, remember? So is it possible? So our guess was very good because we did it, and this is what we obtained. And then this is the moment that I should hear from the audience, wow, beautiful, you did it alone, nobody helped, wow, it's great. So. This, we were happy. So there is scaling. There is scaling, and uh, this is the scaling parameter. It's uh, AW, and uh, AW is just N divided by N pair. This is why I like this. But let's concentrate on what, on what it means. This function, when a C is very small, it means that most of the escape rates are very big, So which means that we have delocalized photons. Photons that escape from the cloud rapidly, more rapidly than uh, wigner weisskopf or even super radiant. On the other hand, if you are close to one, which is here, then it means that most of the eigenvalues are close to zero, which means photons are localized inside the cloud. So this corresponds to localized photons. So here there are localized photons, here there are delocalized photons, and question, is there here a singularity that could tell us that there is a phase transition? You remember what we saw between d equals 2 and d equals 3? That there is this big cusp. Perhaps here is, there is a small cusp, but there is a singularity. And you look at this, you scratch your head, and you say, is there a phase transition or there is no phase transition? This was the idea. Uh, so what is your guess? Is there a phase transition or no phase transition? Who is in favor of there is a phase transition, there is a cusp, there is a singularity somewhere? Okay, who is in favor there is no cusp, no phase transition? You are correct. No phase transition. So let's see. Uh, is there a localization phase transition? <clears throat> so uh, in order to study this curve, we did two things. One thing was a, a brute force a microscopic QED uh, calculation, which in fact could be valid only in the large disorder limit, which, is, which means that if you saw what is W, W was N divided by N perp, is when N is much larger than N perp. The second one, I will explain in a second what it means. Okay, so 
I will not impose this uh, microscopic QED calculation because it is really hard calculation, very technical. But at the end of the day, uh, by doing proper resummation of uh, cumulants, we were able to calculate P of gamma in that limit of very large disorder, and this is what we obtained. And now, uh, so you are a bit lost in the calculation, in the, in the, in the formula here, but from this expression of P of gamma, you can calculate C, the scaling function, and this is the form that it has. It has indeed, it is scaling, but if now you put it on our curve, this is this QD calculation. So you see that indeed it works very well for high disorder, but it doesn't work very well when disorder becomes, uh, when C, sorry, becomes uh, smaller. So it was a nice try, but this is not enough to tell us if there is a singularity, if there is a phase transition or not. But it's a beautiful calculation. So then uh, we did uh, something else, which is called, which is a phenomenological uh, uh, model, which is called small world networks. It has nothing to do with cold atoms. Uh, did you hear about small world networks? Who heard about small world networks? Who never heard about small world networks? So this already, for this, it's an interesting take home message. So you will learn something, not in cold atoms, but uh, so, uh, uh, so this started from a psychology, psychology in the 1960s, but there is this idea that uh, there are countries that are extremely well connected, there are countries that are less well connected. So for instance, uh, the question is, uh, uh, how far you are from, suppose you are an American citizen, and how far you are by acquaintance from a president of the United States. And the problem is not who is the president, whoever president it is, the result is the same. So which means that you know somebody, that, you, that knows somebody, that knows somebody, that knows, that knows in, in the, you know, is acquainted to President of United States. So how many steps between each of, uh, each of the United States uh, citizens and President of United States? You have a guess? Huh? Uh, it's six, I think. I thought there was only one person in between the Soviet citizen and Joseph Okay. Mm. For instance, if you are in a small country like Israel, that people like to, to chat uh, with each other, the, your uh, distance to a prime minister is two. So, which means that uh, uh, you know always somebody that uh, knows the prime minister, because it's much more a connected network. United States, you know, if uh, you take somebody in a boys, uh, and uh, that has to know, so it takes more uh, time. Question in Brazil, which is a big country, 200 million people, uh, what is the, this distance? I don't know, perhaps, so you'll tell me, you, you'll check, okay? And this will tell uh, how connected you are. So, now, out of this, you can build a, a, a uh, statistical mechanics model of graphs, of uh, connected graphs, which are called small world networks. Small world, so now you understand why, okay? And networks, they are graphs. And the point is that we were able to map, and if you want to know how, ask me, I will not tell you more. We were able to map our problem of uh, superradiant atoms and photons onto a small world network. The advantage of it is that those are models that we know if they, have, if they have phase transitions or not. And the small world network that we were using does not have phase transition. It's a mean field theory. And in fact, the, what you, you saw this line here is this phenomenological model. This is Markov small world network. And it's not bad for a remote problem, okay? But the bad news is that uh, this model does not have a phase transition, and therefore, you know, if you believe this or not, this has no phase transition. No phase transition. So we're very sad, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's beautiful. We had scaling, we had all this, but no phase transition. So then, 
we did not, uh, we had hope that perhaps we missed something and all this. Then we said, let's go. I have uh, 25 minutes, yeah. right? Okay, good. Let's uh, go and uh, look at the uh, at, uh, dimensionality dependence. Because you remember that uh, Anderson phase transition depends strongly on uh, dimensionality. In one and two, you don't have phase transition. In three, you have phase transition. So we said, let's look here what happens in lower dimensions. For instance, in one dimension, as I said today, localiz Anderson localization effects are extremely strong. And therefore, perhaps in 1D, we will see that, uh, that there is something that is driven by Anderson localization transition and not by cooperative effects. And we will be able to, to, to say something. So this, one, this was why we studied uh, the space dimension dependence. And so now uh, I will show you an uh, exercise just to enlarge your scope of tools and things like this. It's just, I could give you the answer, but I want to show you how we arrived, we arrived to this answer, because this is, those are nice tools. So in 1D, we start from the same Hamiltonian, the same Vij, but now uh, in this expression of Vij, the imaginary part, which is the random matrix that we study, uh, is not this sync function, but it is cosine of uh, Rij divided by the wavelengths. This is the new function, okay? So this is a new random matrix. And now I ask you the following. Uh, okay, so there are, as usual, I expect two limits, as I told you before. I expect the limit of a very dil dilute large system where I should have wigner weisskopf plus disorder effect. So this is the limit A is very large compared to one. And the other limit, that A is very small compared to one, which is the decay limit. And in that case, the matrix is this one. And this matrix has two eigenvalues at zero and at n. So this is the decay uh, uh, matrix. But now I look at this matrix and I ask you, what are the eigenvalues of this random matrix? I ask you. So what do you think? So there are two, two answers. It's complicated or it's simple. So who thinks that it's complicated? It's a random matrix. It's not, it's not uh, sparse. So there are very few zeros. It's full of uh, minus one, plus, between minus one and plus one randomly, n by n. So who thinks that the spectrum is complicated? Who thinks that it is simple? So why do you think that it is simple? Uh, the sync is not simple. It was numerics because, you know, I, I don't have an, analyt an analytic uh, description of it. But for cosine, it is extremely simple. So just for the pleasure to show you this, that you also will learn something, I will show you why it is simple. Because this n by n random matrix can be written as the product of uh, two of uh, one matrix A and the dagger of A. And this A matrix is a two by N matrix that is defined by this. It's a two by N. And A dagger A is therefore an N by N matrix because it's N times two times two by N. So it's an N by N matrix, okay? So now the spectrum of, uh, of U is the same as the spectrum of, because it is a symmetric uh, matrix. So the spectrum of U it's real symmetric, is the same as the spectrum of U dagger. But U dagger is now a two by two matrix because U is N times two times two by N, but U dagger is two times N times N by two. So it's two by two. So therefore, you just have to diagonalize this matrix. So it is a trick. Uh, if you are coming from spin glasses, you use this trick daily, but uh, if you are not, you don't use it daily. So uh, then you, don't, you just have to uh, diagonalize this matrix where M is a random variable which is given by this. And this has two eigenvalues which are given by this. N is number of atoms. M is this random variable. And the spectrum is just this. So it's very simple. Okay? <clears throat> and now uh, we have P of gamma. So we can 
plot this distribution. And what you see here is that in this distribution, there is absolutely no wigner weisskopf limit, and there is no, there is no, you remember this, how it looks, wigner weisskopf It looks like a function that is uh, uh, picked around gamma zero. So this is not this. So which means here, there is no uh, independent uh, atomic uh, uh, limit. It is strongly related to uh, cooperative effects. So in 1D, cooperative effects are extremely strong, and they, they describe all the, the uh, distribution. There are also subreddent mode, but I did not represent them here. <clears throat> OK, so what did we learn from the one-dimensional random atomic gas is that in D equals to 1, there is no crossover between localized and delocalized photons, like we had in 3D. The single atom wigner weisskopf limit is never reached. And those results in D equals 1 are valid for both ordered and disordered media. In that case, M is not a random variable. So cooperative effect and not disorder is the mechanism underlying for the photon localization in 1D. It's purely cooperative effect, no disorder. Whereas usually we expect that disorder is extremely strong in 1D. So this makes it interesting. Are you interested? Full of interest? Good. So then, what to do? Go for 2D. <laughs> D equals to 2. So uh, now the new matrix, gamma ij, is not this. It's not cosine. It's Bessel function of this. I will not ask the question, do you think it's simple to diagonalize it or not? It is not simple. Okay, you don't have this trick anymore, but you have something that is close to this trick. And this close to this trick is also something that I want to, to, to show you, to teach you. This may be useful. This will be surely useful to you in your career as physicists. This, uh, the fact that we cannot diagonalize it completely, but almost, is very well known uh, in uh, different fields. And this is, uh, what you can do is to decompose this matrix into the product of two matrices, which are those ones. This decomposition is very standard, and it is extremely well known in uh, wireless communication. You know what is wireless communication? I see that from time to time, you know it very well. What is wireless communications? And this is also very well known in another field in physics, which is, again, spin glasses. And this has been used uh, okay, by different people. So here I, see, I cite one of them. The only point is that so you used, we used this trick. And we were able to calculate the spectrum of eigenvalues of this. This is called the marchenko pastour distribution. And then when I say marchenko pastour usually if they are Russian speaking in the audience, they say, not Marchenko, Marchenko. Uh, OK, so. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so this is this distribution. It is extremely well-known distribution, really well-known, like the Gaussian distribution. And so we, we, we derived it, we used it. And the only point you see that it works very well to explain the, the spectrum that, I mean, the the P of gamma that we calculated numerically. <coughs> but no phase transition in all this. This you can show it analytically. So this is just in this expression. No phase transition. So we tried 1D, 2D, 3D with uh, small networks, everything. No phase transition. Nothing. Then we were uh, sad, and we scratched our head. So it took us six years to do this. And uh, then we said, OK, but you remember that all what we did here was to look at the Lindblad expression and to see that everything is driven by this imaginary part of uh, Vij, of the interacting potential. And because this is what drives the, the escape rate. But perhaps it was not a good idea. And what we should do is to look again at the effective Hamiltonian, the non-Hermitian effective Hamiltonian, 
But instead of looking at only this part and to diagonalize this part, we should diagonalize everybody, all the eigenenergies of this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. And perhaps this will tell us something more, because it's not the same, the spectrum of uh, just the imaginary part or the whole spectrum, and to take the imaginary part. Okay, so this is what uh, we did in uh, 2014. So it took us again about six years to realize this. And then we uh, decided to diagonalize uh, the full Hamiltonian, non-emission Hamiltonian. So you already noticed that to diagonalize a real symmetric matrix, you have to get up early in the morning you know, to, to do this. But to diagonalize this, you have to get up even earlier. You know? And this is mostly numerics. We don't have uh, good models, but here are the results. So first of all, uh, if you look at the n equals two, two atoms, then it's very simple to diagonalize uh, the total Hamiltonian. And this is what it looks like. This is the imaginary part. So the, the uh, spectrum of the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, which has a real part and imaginary part, is written by this, is defined by this. And we write it under that way, which makes this lambda n dimensionless. And this is the imaginary part of lambda and the real part of lambda that are plotted here for n equals to two. If you are a bit familiar with what I, with what I said for n equals to two, the, you know, the two states, uh, degenerate states that we had, those are the cooperative pairs. Those and those are not, okay? So uh, this is extremely, so once you get used to it, so first of all, it's beautiful. There are two spirals here and, um, uh, but this is n equals to two. Now, if you go for n atoms, it is, this is for the scalar case, by the way. For the vectorial case, it looks like this, but it's a bit more complicated. If you go to n large, it looks like this. But then you develop a sense of looking at such numerics for, uh, for cooperative states, and then here you can identify the cooperative states, which are here, here, and here, and along that direction. So this is just to show you that it's not very simple, but we, we know how to read those diagrams, those numerics. And uh, then uh, the idea was to try to understand those results. So then we had to uh, think a bit more and to think in terms of uh, what people did in the uh, Anderson localization transition and to, uh, to dig out another tool, which is called the Tauless parameter. So we saw uh, yesterday or day before yesterday the Tauless energy. And I told you the Tauless energy was just to honor him because he did not invent him. But the Tauless parameter, he did invent him. So this is really the same Tauless. And this is a new a tool that he really invented in order to probe localization phase transition. Now this tool, for a reason that is absolutely obscure to me, is absolutely uh, forgotten by all the people working in localization transition today. Although for 30 years, it was intensively used by everybody. I think that half of my PhD was on uh, trying to understand this and all this, but anyway. So, and this is a beautiful and very, very, very clever idea of Taules that he produced in uh, two papers in uh, 72 and 77, which is a long time ago. And this was, uh, uh, this parameter was generalized for random matrix theory uh, by Italian group and by uh, Gilles Montembeau and myself in 92. Okay, so the idea is the following. Now, think for a, uh, Five minutes, back to conductors, okay? So I have uh, this, uh, this wire of, uh, okay, wire. It's a disordered system, and it's a quantum disordered system. It has an energy spectrum. Now I take another piece. It is also a random collection of uh, energy levels, and this is not the same. 
So the spectrum are different. Okay, very good. And now, this is what is represented here. So you have, this is the first wire, it has a length L. This is the second wire, it has a length L. And this is the distribution of energy levels. I solve the Schrodinger equation numerically, or your favorite equation. This is the spectrum of energy that I obtained. This is the second wire. It's another distribution, okay? It's another distribution of energies. They are both random. And now, uh, since, uh, so I call delta E the, uh, the distribution of energy between nearest neighbors. And now I couple the two systems because I want to, be, to build a wire that is twice as large, 2L. I couple the two. What happens? If the spectrum will be identical, then I will have electronic states that are the same here for the first wire and second wire. So they are delocalized modes. So electrons can flow through. If the spectra are completely different, there is no overlap between the energy states, and therefore electrons will not flow. They will be either here or there. So if there is a parameter that could describe this overlap of energy spectra. Now, okay, this is the idea that I always uh, asked. And now what he said, he said, when you couple the two systems, in fact, the energies are not eigen energies because they are coupled systems. So they acquire a broadening that I call big gamma here. And if this broadening is such that the broadening is overcome the distance between nearest neighbors, then I will have always a good conductor. If the broadening is so small that I could not match between the two spectra, then my system will be an insulator and modes will be localized. It's beautiful physics. I mean, I don't know, it's so general. And it's, and that's it. No? I think I was crying the first time I, I understood this, you know? Not you? Instead, you are doing wireless communication. Okay, so uh, uh, this is the idea. And this idea led him to define this parameter that is called G of L, because it's exactly, okay, this parameter is, you take the uh, broadening of the levels, you average I means average over the spectrum here, you divide by the mean distance between, average, between consecutive nearest neighbor uh, levels, you average over the whole spectrum, and this you average over this order. So it's not obvious. And this parameter, uh, you call it, it is dimensionless, it's a ratio of two energies, and it is, you call it G of L. The beauty, and it took many years to people to realize, is that this is the conductance, the electrical conductance. You can just prove that this is the electrical conductance that I discussed yesterday, and this is also the inverse probability of quantum crossings, because it's the same letter, that's why. It's fine, it's nice. Life is beautiful at 10.25. So now, uh, if this parameter G is much larger than one, this is what I ex just explained to you, then you have a large overlap between the two spectra, and you have delocalized states, and you have a conductor. If G is much smaller than one, you have a small overlap, localized states, you have an insulator. Okay? So this is the bottom line. Nice. Uh, then we took this idea in our case, and, uh, oh, okay, so this parameter, just what I said, that uh, what I told you yesterday, that uh, we have this conductance, uh, that it is a scaling form and all this, the idea of uh, Taules is that, in fact, the Anderson scaling works with the Taules parameter. So this, you understood this already? This beta function, you remember what it is, that this is logarithmic derivative of uh, G with respect to L. I discussed it uh, yesterday. And uh, if this function is zero, it means that we have a phase transition and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this I said yesterday, so I will not repeat it. This is what I showed yesterday and today. And this is this Taules. Now you have to think of it 
as a tauless parameter. This tauless parameter behaves like this. And in fact, what I didn't tell you is that uh, yesterday is that those plots were realized by calculating the tauless parameter. So this is a plot of the tauless parameter. So now we took the same idea because I suffered uh, understanding it, this during my PhD thesis. And in our uh, case, so this was uh, 2014, and we said, okay, this is the tauless parameter. So now we have imaginary part. This is the imaginary part of this. Real part, real part of this. And we can build this G of A. Uh, so you have five more minutes. You don't have to... But now the problem is that you did not pay attention to this, but uh, this imaginary part is a constraint. I did not emphasize this. The constraint is that this guy is always equal to one. Uh, so you did not, I didn't say, and it's like this, okay? So it does not work that way. So we had to find something else than this gamma i. So what we did was just to define another g parameter, not this one, but one over, one over gamma i, times delta E. So now you may ask why this one and not another one? No answer. This is just now, uh, uh, you know, you have to play with this and to find a good scaling function. So it's just, uh, you know, you call it uh, professionalism. professionalism. We know how to do this, okay. So, but it was a, a wild guess. And then uh, we use this parameter and we plot this parameter as a function of the size of the system. You remember A, L divided by lambda, for all possible disorders, uh, from very small disorder to very strong disorder. And this is uh, what we obtained for the scalar case. So this is scaling, obviously. So I don't have to convince you now. You know you're experts in scaling. But what you see is that uh, for a small dis smaller disordered disorders, G is a decreasing function of L. But here there is a value of G where this trend is changes. Above this, those values of disorder, you see that G is an increasing function of L. So which means that here, G becomes function that is independent of L. And this means that this Gelman law function beta of G vanishes. And if this vanishes, it means that there is a phase transition. And there were a phase transition. Here is a phase transition. We found it, finally, by looking at the spectrum of the whole Hamiltonian, and not only the imaginary part of the Hamiltonian. And this is a beautiful phase transition. You see that at this point, uh, all the curves go through whatever the length is, this is, a function, this is a critical point, and this is the value of the critical, va the critical value of the, of the conductance of the tauless parameter. And we had the phase transition, and we were extremely happy, and again, champagne flows. And now the question was, which is, what is this phase transition? Is it Anderson phase transition? Is it, what is the universality class? What is all this? And it was already quite clear to us that it's not Anderson phase transition because we were able to calculate the critical exponents. So I will not enter into this because I have two minutes, but I will tell you what was uh, the big problem. So there is a phase transition. All this was for scalar waves, you remember? Scalar waves. And then we said, but real waves are non-scalar waves, they are polarized. You remember this very, very difficult, big expression of the potential Vij and all this? So we did the same for full uh, uh, potential. And this is what we obtained. For the vector case, polarized wave, there is no phase transition. But you have scaling. You have scaling, but no phase transition. So it's beautiful because you have scaling, but phase transition went away. So what happens? Why for scalar waves we have phase transition, whereas for polarized waves we don't have phase transition? Uh, so this is uh, polarized vectorial waves. This is scalar waves. You see that in one case there is, phase, there, are phase, there is a phase transition, not in the other case. You see it uh, here. There is a critical point. Here there is no critical point. 
and here beta vanishes, here beta never vanishes. So it's all the same. There is no phase transition for the vector L case. Uh, and until today, we don't know why. We don't know to, uh, to explain why there is a phase transition in one case and not in the other one. So you are, so you are still working on it. And I told you at the beginning of uh, of this uh, lesson that uh, uh, two days ago we posted the paper with uh, Robin and all this, which is yet another attempt to understand those results. So it's still, you know, ongoing. And uh, and so you are invited to participate to this beautiful game if you are interested in. And let me just summarize all what I said today. Uh, we studied uh, the scaling properties of the non-Hermitian Euclidean random Hamiltonian, which is this one. Uh, this Hamiltonian accounts for cooperative properties of the atomic gas, separadiance and subradiance. It also depends on the disorder. The radiation pattern is well accounted by the the imaginary part of the interaction, which is this part. And the distribution of eigenvalues of this imaginary part exhibits scaling properties, but there is no indication of the existence of a phase transition driven either by disorder or by uh, cooperative effects. And the interplay between disorder and cooperative effects depends upon the space dimensionality. For two or three uh, dimensions, there is a crossover between a delocalized wigner weisskopf regime and the behavior dri driven by cooperative effects, the DK regime. In D equals to one, there is no such single atom limit, which is already a very interesting result uh, by itself. And then we studied the eigenvalue distribution of the complete non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, and this also exhibits scaling properties we found a critical behavior and a phase transition for scalar waves using this conveniently defined tauless conductance for that problem. And the critical behavior disappears for vector waves. And uh, the nature of and universality of this transition is still unclear. And now we are looking for a new experimental efforts to, to study it. So Robin Kaiser is one of the, of the uh, main players in this uh, in this game, but there is uh, also the group of Antoine Brois in uh, France, of uh, Mike Heve in the U.S. and uh, some others, and uh, I think that it's about it. Huh? Nothing else. So thank you very much. They are shut down completely. So let me ask a question. Did you learn something today? Did you understand everything? No, because I didn't also, so it would be. So then you should have questions. What is a small world network? Why is it important here? Why it is a relation with the spin glasses? Anderson localization is, uh, can be formulated in the, most, the very simple way. So I will use Schrodinger equation instead of wave equation, but it's the same. You take one particle, single particle problem, you write an Hamiltonian, which is the sum of kinetic energy, P squared divided by 2M, plus uh, uh, interaction with potential, this potential must be with the density of scatterers. So it has uh, an expression of that sort. V of R. And this V of R is, can be written as a sum from uh, I equals one to a given number of scatterers of Vi delta of R minus Ri. So this is random. This is a random potential. So this has a distribution. 
This distribution can be Gaussian, white noise, whatever. And this distribution has the width. And if you, uh, if you have a very weak disorder and you solve for the spectrum, the eigenfunctions of this problem, the eigenfunctions are delocalized, so they are plane waves, essentially. If you increase the width of disorder, this, which means the, 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 the strength of the disorder, for a critical value of this width, this critical value, exactly what I said here, then you have a transition between delocalized states, plane waves, and exponentially localized states. It's very important that they are exponential and not something else. You could have power law localization, but this is a completely different problem. For instance, if you take a quasi-crystal, which is a quasi-periodic uh, order, you, have, you may have also such a transition, but not to exponentially localized system, uh, modes, but power law localized. So this transition for a critical value of the strength and for a dimension that is larger, strictly larger than two, then you observe this transition. If you are for a dimension that is smaller than two or equal, then the modes are always exponentially localized with a given localization length that is very small in 1D. So you see exponential localization. In 2D, this localization length can be larger than Earth to Moon distance. So it is extremely big. So you are localized for an infinite system, but in the reality, you don't see really very much the localization. And this is uh, this transition. When you, you showed the plot uh, showing that there is no uh, weak probability distance for the vector weight, is that possible that we have a phase transition in a different place and it's actually below the graph this level? No. I mean, no. For what we, we saw, there is no, no, no such possibility. We just uh, look at the, at the, uh, the range of uh, disorder. It's from almost zero disorder to extremely strong disorder that we are close to the decay limit. So but if we go even lower, lower, what is lower, lower? Lower, lower, it's, uh, you know, you cannot have phase transition. You have no disorder. Maybe. So I, I would be uh, very surprised, but. You know, never say impossible, but no. No, what we have to understand is what is, so we have uh, guesses about uh, uh, what is this, uh, why do we have a phase transition here? Here we add things. We add long-range long interactions. This one over r cube, one over r squared terms. So we know that it's because of this. Yep. Hmm? Ah, spin glasses. So you have a, a magnetic order in, a, you know that you build, for instance, a Ising model or Eisenberg model, and you know that you may have, you have coupling between the spins. This coupling can be either ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic. If it is ferromagnetic, uh, you uh, lower the energy by having spins that way. If it is antiferromagnetic, you lower energy by having spins that way. Okay. Now suppose that you have random interaction between, between the spins. Random interaction, it can be for different physical sources that I, will, that I can tell, but uh, suppose it's, it's a model. So now it's random. And this means that if you take uh, three spins, you may have between those two spins uh, uh, ferromagnetic order favored, between those two spins antiferromagnetic, and uh, here, then you cannot decide because uh, those, they want to be like this and that. So you have, uh, uh, it's very difficult to find the ground state of such a system. And this is called a spin glass problem because it's a problem that, the, in fact, the ground state, you have an infinitely many ground states that are very, very close one to the other, almost degenerate, but not. And in fact, you don't, the system doesn't know which one to choose. 
So this is a very famous random problem. In fact, there are three very famous random problems. One is localization, a random problem. Second one is spin glasses, it's a random problem. Third one is percolation, it's also a random problem. Percolation, percolation. Okay, and uh, what is the relation between those two? Okay, this is, and what you see is that, for instance, this problem has relation with spin glasses. I don't believe in anything. But why it should be stronger than on the small calculation? No, what we saw here is that uh, 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 in 1D and 2D, all the behavior is driven by cooperative effects. It's not driven by disorder. And the 1D problem is interesting in that you know, if disorder is expected to play a role, I mean, Anderson localization, what I just said here, that if you are in 1D, states are always strongly localized. So, but in our problem, in 1D, where we expect disorder, Anderson localized disorder to, be, to play a very strong role, you see that, in fact, it is completely dominated by cooperative effect, this cosine Xij matrix. It's purely cooperative effect. So disorder does not play a role, although we expect it to play. So you won when you said... Uh, Yes? You see that you have questions. Why are you are so inhibited? You, know, it's, uh, you should come to Israel. You know, in Israel, after one minute, people are just jumping at you and saying, this is not true, you are lying, this is, you know. You should, uh, <laughs> it's too relaxing here. Could you see what happens in? Uh, yes, but I'm looking for a good PhD student to do it. <laughs> and this is the truth. <laughs> You're invited. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, we, don't, we, this is, we plan to do this, but uh, not yet. Okay, so it's time to...